My name is Lisa Peterson. I'm the Extension Livestock and Beef Quality Specialist with NDSU Extension, and I'm housed at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center near Streeter, North Dakota. Today, I'm going to visit with you about implanting, everything from the wise and good technique to some regulation changes that occurred as of July 1st, 2023. So let's get started. An old rancher once told me the only thing worse than not implanting is implanting wrong. A uh, widely reported return on investment um, research shows that for every dollar we invest in an implanting program, 10 to $15 is returned. And so what that means is that if we invest $10 into an implanting program, $100 to $150 per animal will be returned. The important part of this is proper management. And that includes the selection of implants for the goals of your operation, the goals of the cattle that we are feeding, um, whether those happen to be gain goals or maybe carcass quality goals, and our feed resources. And it's also important to remember that cleanliness and technique are next to godliness. Let's start with the end in mind. What is the goal of, of our implanting program, of our feeding program? What are our carcass quality targets? Are we feeding uh, to have cattle in a prime um, quality grade or is select good enough and we are going to uh, feed those cattle maybe for a live market, live marketing program? Um, what's our targeted average daily gain? Are these cattle that we're going to uh, grow a little bit slower in a backgrounding or stalker type program or are these cattle that are really in the middle of their finishing program in a feed yard? And what about replacement heifers? Can we implant replacement heifers? And the answer is yes. Uh, research shows that we can safely, and when I say safely, meaning that we don't have any negative effects to uh, fertility, implant replacement heifers uh, between about 75 days of age and about 400 pounds or at weaning time. Uh, so somewhere in that 200 day range, 200 day of age, day of age range. Now, I will tell you personally, I think this is a conversation you need to have with your veterinarian. If you know that most of your, of your heifers are targeted for a replacement heifer market, maybe I wouldn't implant them. But if that's a decision that you're going to make down the road, I might. So I think you need to have this conversation uh, with your herd veterinarian. Next, select an implant strategy according uh, to those goals that we have established. The diets, you know, are these cattle that are going to be in a, a lower energy diet or are these cattle that are going to be on a high energy diet? What type of breeds are these cattle? Are these English cattle, uh, continental um, European type cattle? Are these Boss Indicus cattle or, or Brahmin type cattle? Or are these cattle that are maybe a beef on dairy type, uh, type of an animal? What sex are we going to be feeding and implanting? Um, I think it's important that we talk about the condition of the cattle being implanted. Are they really green? And so they're going to be in a lot of compensatory gain in the early phase of their feeding. If so, I think we need to delay implanting so that we don't decrease any quality grade on the backside of our, our finishing program. What is the age of the cattle? Have they been previously implanted? And again, I think it's very important for us to utilize our herd veterinarians or our operation veterinarian to help us select the correct implant program and the correct, product, correct products for our situation. Human safety is the most important thing that we need to talk about. Uh, first of all, on the human safety side of consuming beef that has uh, come from implanted cattle, repeatedly uh, independent, Third-party reviewed scientific research shows beef from implanted cattle is safe, from human safe for human consumption. There is no doubt about that. We can eat our beef from implanted cattle uh, with a whole lot of confidence that it's safe. When we're talking about the safety of humans that are actually implanting cattle, it's important that we read all label instructions and precautions before we implant. And while we're implanting, that we wear some heavy-duty nitrile-type gloves. Um, that'll protect us from um, any, or help protect from accidental pokes, from accidental exposure to the implant should an implant break. And I, I just think that it is good, uh, a good PPE or personal protective equipment to use in this situation. If we do poke ourselves with an implanting needle and we do not implant an implant, it's important that we immediately wash that area thoroughly. 
um, make sure that we, to the best of our, our knowledge, have gotten the you know, dirt and hair and manure uh, out of that area and then uh, dry it off and apply an antibiotic cream or salve. If that area does become infected, uh, becomes red, warm to the touch, it is really crucial that you see a medical doctor quickly um, to have them look at that infection and help treat with antibiotics. Um, if a needle poke does occur and we implant an implant into a human, we need to seek medical attention immediately to safely remove that implant. Let's talk about implants and proper implant placement. And that starts with the correct placement, which is in the backside of the ear between the skin and cartilage and in the middle one third of the ear. And that's the middle one third uh, from the base of the head here where the cartilage ring is, the tip of the ear, and the middle one third from top to bottom. And we're going to want to put that implant in an area in between the cartilage rib of the ear. And so it will go on the back side of the ear between the skin and cartilage, and again in the middle third of the ear. If we put an implant someplace else, that is extra label use of implants. Next, we need to read the label and confirm that the product is labeled for the class of cattle that we intend to implant into. Ensure the correct dosage and the location and procedures being followed. This is maybe a place in our operations that if we have some employees or help that aren't very um, skilled in implanting that we talk about proper implant uh, procedure. Have all the necessary equipment to maintain sanitary uh, implanting technique handy. So some disinfectant um, that is mixed to follow, mixed according to label instructions. Um, most of the companies prefer, prefer chlorhexidine. It would be the trade name Novasan, as many people would know it. Um, that is the preferred disinfectant because it won't decompose um, the pellets on the out, or the, the coating on the outside of the pellets of the implant. We'll want a tray to hold the disinfectant and a sponge and in and an in, the sponge and the implanting gun. Um, a nice paint tray, a cheap paint tray, works really well here. We're going to want a sponge uh, that we can wipe off the implanting needle with, uh, both the outside and the face of the needle. A brush and a scraper to clean near the ears as needed, and of course, an extra implant needle. Most crushed implants are due uh, to uh, dull implant needles, so always have an extra needle handy. Understand how to use your implant gun. There's many implant guns on the market. Um, each company has their own. Go through some dry runs of using that thing to make sure that you know how to use it. Next, properly restrain the animal uh, to minimize head movement. Um, this will decrease faulty implanting and faulty implant placement. It'll also uh, assure human safety and animal safety. Um, the other reason why most implants are crushed or put in the wrong place is because animals are not properly restrained. And if this is a place that we need to use a halter, um, it's pretty easy to throw a halter on an animal and tie their head back. Next, inspect the ear, uh, check for previous implants, ear tags and ear tag holes because uh, that scar tissue around those ear tags and ear tag holes will have very little blood flow. And so we're going to want to implant about a finger distance away from those. Look for any uh, abscesses, mud, manure, debris, um, and clean off that ear and dry it if there is any mud, manure, and debris before we implant. I think it's really important that we understand you cannot disinfect a turd and therefore we should not implant through mud or manure. Um, that's just a great invitation to build an abscess within that implant in the ear, and we will essentially remove all the value that we could have gotten from that implant, plus probably add some cost for treatment. If an implant is present, do not re-implant, um, just let the animal loose. Wipe off your hands before you handle the applicator. Uh, we don't want to cross-contaminate any part of that applicator. Wipe your needle through the sponge to disinfect the outside of the entire needle, and then pull the tip of the needle with the bevel face, um, bevel facing down against the sponge to clean out any organic material that might be inside the needle. Next, pinch the tip of the animal's ear between the thumb and forefinger and place the needle um, against the ear at a slight angle with the bevel side up away from the ear at the outer edge of the implant zone. Slide the needle under the skin of the ear, insert it fully, 
Um, ensure, assure that it's under the skin and not punctured all the way through or in the cartilage. And if the needle happens to skip off the back of the ear, disinfect the needle and the tip again and um, go through that process again. Then slide the needle back, uh, back out of the ear about the length of the implant. Some implant guns automatically withdraw the needle, um, but and the new ones do, but some of the older ones don't. And then pull the trigger, trigger to deposit the implant and withdraw the needle completely. The final steps of proper implant procedure to implant to palpate the implant site to assure that the pellets are not bunched or crushed. Um, bunched and crushed pellets, again, are an indication of equipment issues, poor animal restraint, and poor implant technique. So slow down, check out that needle, make sure your needle tip is still sharp. Uh, if we need to restrain animals' heads using um, a halter, do that, but slow down, it'll pay off in the end. Next, return the applicator to the tray, wipe the needle across the sponge to disinfect it, and we're ready to implant the next animal. This video is going to show the anatomical sites of the bovine ear and where we want the implant. So some structures on the ear here. These blue lines are our veins and arteries. This is all the vascularity in the ear, and this actually top one, um, you can draw blood out of it if you ever needed to. The white structures here are our cartilage, our cartilage ribs. We do not want to implant in those because there's no vascularity. And then this blue green teal right here, this is where we implanted. So you can see it's sitting right along this vein and in between the vein and the cartilage rib. So it gets the best amount of vascularity that we have in the ear. And then we have our bangs tag here and the normal ear tag here. So we are at least a finger's distance from all of those uh, structures. Results of improperly placed implants include uh, decreased efficacy of that implant. If we put that implant into the cartilage, um, it'll still be there because there's very little blood flow in the cartilage. Of course, if we uh, go through the ear and give it to the ground, it's not going to do the ground much good. Uh, trim loss at packing plants can be an issue if it uh, goes into the cartilage ring at the base of the ear. Um, consumer concerns about the safety and wholesomeness of beef and regulatory liability. And you're probably thinking, why does this gal have pictures of cow ear chew treats for dogs on this uh, slide? I will remind folks that and our pets are part of our family. And um, if we are buying cow ears for our dogs to chew on, we don't want any implants in this cartilage tissue that they would be chewing. And so just think about um, what that perception would be uh, to a consumer who had bought cow ears for their dogs if there was implants in those. And so it's not only always our safety, but also it can be our pet's safety. As I said earlier, some other common implanting errors are crushing where the active ingredients would be released too quickly. Uh, if we put that implant in the cartilage, we will decrease the efficacy pretty significantly. In that case, we're going to want to remove the implant and re-implant in the other ear. If we sever a blood vessel, um, if it stays, if that implant stays in the ear, uh, the active ingredients again will be absorbed too quickly, and so we're going to want to remove that implant and implant the other in the other ear. And if we put it in the wrong spot, um, again, we're going to want to cut that implant out and re-implant. Infected and abscessed sites always are an issue. They decrease the return on investment significantly. You will not get the full payout of those implants. And as always, read the product label for proper instructions on approved use. In talking about infected and abscessed implants versus normal implants, in a study done at Kansas State University, they evaluated um, cattle that had infected or abscessed implants versus cattle that had normal implants. And what they found was that with the heifers that had infected or abscessed implants, their average daily gain was reduced 9%, just short of 9%. Uh, they had a decreased feed efficiency of about 8.5%. And, 
And the big deal is, is that the net return in our 2024 economics was about $60 per head. So everything that we could have gotten out of that implant was almost lost due uh, to having an abscessed implant. And so it pays to make the effort to have good implanting technique. And if we're going to do it, we want to do it right. When we implant, cleanliness is next to godliness. And so we'll talk about preparing the ear here for an implant. So we always want to stay one ear, finger width distance from a tag. So that works really good. I'm going to clean off this ear. This is just the Nolva San water mix, disinfectant water mix, to make sure the ear is clean. Because when we implant, cleanliness is next to godliness. Also going to want the needle and so we're going to run that needle across the sponge on the outside and then that bevel face across the sponge as well uh, to remove any blood or dirt or debris that might be inside that needle tip. And our final step is to implant and make sure that the implant is in the proper location. And so you can see here that we're going to stick that needle in the middle third of the ear implant and check to make sure it's in the right spot and we have a successful implant. Let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about um, the FDA's guidance for industry GFI 191, which was implemented on July 1st, 2023. GFI 191 does several things. One of the things it does is it defines which implants are available for re-implantation depending on age, production class, and weight class of animals. QR um, code that you can turn on um, the camera on your phone, uh, focus in on this QR code and it will take you directly uh, to the FDA's page. This page is really, really nice. I like it a lot. It's easy to understand. It talks about the different classes of animals and which implants are available for use and re-implanting in each of those classes. And so it defines these calves. Uh, defines growing beef cattle on pasture. This would be uh, like stalker cattle that would be um, yearlings out on, on grass or maybe cattle uh, that are grazing wheat pastures, uh, growing beef in a tri lot. So uh, these, are cows. these would be cattle that are on a high roughage diet being protein supplemented. Um, growing beef in a grow yard, and growing beef in confinement, both for slaughter, are held in the same category. Uh, grow yard section would be what many of us would consider um, a warm-up feed yard, um, a backgrounding yard uh, for a step before going into confinement for slaughter or a finishing lot. Um, we'll look at those categories here. So as we talked about, um, they define those calves as being less than two months of age or greater and equal to two months of age, growing those cattle on pasture. Uh, growing cattle in a dry lot, um, which would be gr uh, weaned growing beef, steers, or heifers that would be maintained in a dry lot and receive the majority of their diet from forage. Um, growing cattle in a grow yard for slaughter, um, something again like a backgrounding lot, and then growing uh, cattle in confinement for finishing or for slaughter. Um, I appreciate these slides from Dr. D. Consanzo from University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, and need to give him credit for sharing those. As you can see, uh, there are no products labeled for re-implantation within each of these product classes for um, calves for the cattle growing on pasture and cattle growing in a dry lot. When we get over to the growing a grow yard or in a backgrounding yard for slaughter and growing in confinement for slaughter, we have a few options uh, for re-implantation. Um, those are Cinevex C if we re-implant with Cinevex S. Uh, Cinevex S, we can re-implant with Cinevex S. Cinevex Choice can be re-implanted with either Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus, or Cinevex One Feedlot. And here at the bottom in this lighter category, uh, Cinevex Plus is a terminal implant or Cinevex Choice and Cinevex 1 feedlot is the terminal implant, again, for Cinevex choice. When we get to the top of this category, Computos, Encore, the components, Ralgro, Ralgro the Revelors, and Cinevex 1 grower and Cinevex 8 do not have a label for reimplantation um, while they are in a 
grow yard or backgrounding yard and in confinement for slaughter. And again, those are considered one production class. And so we cannot reimplant those, uh, those implants at any time in this production class. So in conclusion, um, the only thing worse than not implanting is implanting wrong. Implant with the end in mind. What is our long-term goal of these cattle? What are our production goals? Cleanliness and technique, good implanting technique are next to godliness. Visit with your veterinarian to help select the correct implanting strategy uh, for the set of cattle you're considering implanting. Understand, understand GFI and the rules for re-implanting. It is very important um, for your operation and for our industry that you do that. And above all, human safety is paramount. Take care of yourselves and use some good personal protective equipment. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, discussion about using implants. Feel free to contact me at any time. Mm -hmm.